So, good day to all of you. So, we're already on our third lesson. So, it's all about selected tissues of occupational biomechanics. So, we're going to understand what is occupational biomechanics and why is it important in our workplace. So, let's start our lesson. Okay, so... Beginning and development of biomechanics. So biomechanics is a science dealing with equilibria in human motions. It studies the mechanical properties of tissues, organs, and systems, as well as the mechanical motion of living organisms and its causes and results. There are external and internal forces. For external, we have gravity. And then for internal, we have muscles. And these are forces that cause body motion. As a result of these forces, the position of a body or one's own body or foreign bodies changes or body deformation occurs. The name biomechanics is derived from the Greek word mechana, which means tool, and then the suffix bio indicates that this science concerns living organisms, such as like with biology. Biology is the study of life. So that's where the biomechanics term is derived from the word mechana and bio. Biomechanics combines knowledge from the fields of mathematics, physics, and anatomy. So the foundations of this science were laid long ago by mathematicians and physicians. Even Socrates, who lived 2,400 years ago, thought that we would not be able to understand the world around us without understanding ourselves. Also, another um, popular Philosopher is we have Aristotle, a physician's son who possessed an ex exceptional gift for observation, expanded upon this idea and was fascinated by the anatomy and structure of living creatures. He perceived the movements of animals as similar to those of mechanical systems. Aristotle laid the foundations of mechanics, referring to levers and forces acting on a given arm. And then 200 years later, Archimedes said, Give me where to stand, and I will move the earth. His works allowed for the development of statistics and the use of both forces and moments of forces for the mechanics of living creatures. And then Leonardo da Vinci, which is, we are more popular that he's a painter of the popular Mona Lisa, but he also has a contribution with, with human anatomy. So he also played an unquestionable role in the development of biomechanics. He described the anatomy of humans and was likely the first person to study the stability of the spine. Da Vinci found that muscle forces acted along the link between a muscle attachment and the point of the application of force. So this is a picture, actually an image. This is actually the original drawing of Da Vinci. So by means of he drew, he drew the... the uh, a body of a human, a, uh, of a male human, it means that he is also interested with human anatomy. So, Giovanni Alfonso Berelli is considered to be the father of biomechanics. In association with Marcello Malpigi, he presented an analysis of spine load for the first time ever in a work entitled De Moto Animalium. Borelli determine the forces that were necessary to maintain static equilibrium in the different joints of the human body. So biomechanics is applied to describe internal phenomena such as the forces, structure, or electrical activities of muscles, as well as external phenomena described using the analysis of motion and force characteristics. Because biomechanics is an interdisciplinary science, Studying the structure of the motions of living organisms, especially humans, and mainly uses the methods of mechanics, the laws of classical mechanics are applied to biomechanics. Above all, the laws of motion formulated under the name of Newton's principle of dynamic, dynamics or uh, principles of motion, if you studied physics. So the first principle states that a physical body will remain at rest or continue to move at a constant velocity unless an outside force, net, outside net force acts upon it. And the second principle regards a change in the motion, velocity, or the momentum and states that the rate of a change in momentum is proportional to the force acting on the body and takes place in the direction of that force. And then the last and not 
but not the least, uh, the third principle states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So one of the basic objectives of biomechanics is to describe the position of a body and the changes to this position, namely motion. Analysis of the motion may be based on anatomy and physiology as well as, uh, as, well as on external observation of the motion. So Etienne Jules Murray and Edward James Muybridge were forerunners in the analysis of motion. As early as 1882, they used a prototype of a roll of film to capture photographs in burst mode. So using special cameras, they photographed the various phases of motion of a galloping horse on a wet collodion plates. So these pictures were scientific proof that a galloping horse leaps from the ground with one leg while the other is lifted slightly. So in addition, Murray developed a post called Stadion Physiologique to investigate forces of pressure acting on the ground. This was a prototype of a dynamometric platform. So if we have biomechanics, so we also have occupational biomechanics. The International Society of Biomechanics suggests dividing the subject of biomechanics into three subtopics. We have Engineering biomechanics involving models and human machine systems, medical biomechanics based on anatomy and physiology, physiology, and general biomechanics involving methodology, functional structures, control of biological systems, data collection, and biomechanics of sports and basic movements. So occupational biomechanics is related to ergonomics. So as you can remember, ergonomics is the design of tools that which should be in line with our body movements, with our body structure. So it's also related to anthropometry, physiology, and psychology. And then occupational biomechanics discusses the causes and results of load resulting from physical work, the human musculoskeletal system, and this biomechanics is widely used to design workplaces and processes. So this design process should include analysis of body load due to occupational activities and its comparison with the worker's abilities, which are determined based on the biomechanical properties of the musculoskeletal system. So the typical goals of occupational biomechanics are as follows. First is to investigate the structures and functions of the musculoskeletal system, which is treated as an apparatus of work measure the mechanical parameters or forces and moments of the forces acting on the human body, dislocations, velocities, and accelerations of body segments while working, measure muscle function by electromyography, to perform mechanical modeling and computer simulation of work processes, assess the load on the human body while it performs typical activities such as carrying weight and operating machines or computers. So positions and movements of body segments. The motor apparatus of living organisms is based on mobility in adjacent body segments that are linked by joints. So the total number of all movements, called number of degrees of freedom, may be performed at specific joints, assuming that each of these movements may be performed independently depending on the biomechanism. So in humans, the number of degrees of freedom may be 240 to 250. As a result, the positions of different segments in relation to each other in the occupational environment have to be described using approximately 250 variables. So as you can see, the number of degrees of freedom of humans of a human body is 240 to 250. So meaning, our body is really made to move, to work. So because of this many uh, or, or so uh, high degrees of freedom of our body. So it is not really advisable that we will live a sedentary lifestyle. We should have, a, uh, we should be active physically. So that's why, as in previous lesson, it is really stated or it's really recommended that you should include exercise in your daily routine. So the body of a biomechanism may be comprised of various numbers of segments, which depend on the complexity of the model. The number of degrees of freedom also depends on the accuracy. So the positions and movements of separate human body parts as are usually described with reference to three body planes. We have the sagittal, we have the frontal, and we have the transverse. So the angles of abduction and adduction occur in the frontal plane. 
angles of flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane. And the angles of rotation, namely the rotating movement towards the inside, the pronation, and the outside, as we have the supination, occur in the transverse plane. As a result, the, body, the position of a body can be defined using angles of the three planes. The number of angles corresponds to the number of degrees of freedom. In other words, in the case of the most detailed human model, it would be 250 angles. So, this is the uh, planes of motion, the three planes of motion, the front plane. front plane divides the body with exterior, uh, anterior and posterior parts or halves, while sagittal plane divides the body into left and right sides, and the transverse plane divides the body with upper and lower part of the body. So to further understand what are the movements that are associated with frontal, with sagittal, and transverse plane? You can see the additional or uh, supplemental video to further understand motions that occur in this plane. So the total value of all the angles equals zero in the natural position. Straight standing position with the upper limbs hanging along the body or standing in attention. So the, uh, the human upper limbs may be modeled using 30 degrees of freedom. However, they may also be modeled using the minimum number, the 7 degrees of freedom. In such a minimalist case, the hand is replaced with a single segment, excluding the possibilities of manipulation, which makes it possible to represent the basic force characteristics of the upper limb. A simplified model of the upper limb, expressed using a kinematic chain with 7 degrees of freedom, uses 7 angles, which describes how the limb deviates from a natural position in terms of flexion, extension, abduction, abduction, rotation along the arm axis, pronation, and supination. So this is an illustration of a 7 degrees of freedom, the basic force of our upper limb. So we have... For letter A, it's we have the abduction or adduction angle in the transverse plane. And then letter B, the angle of arm flexion or extension in the sagittal plane. And then letter C, the angle of rotation around the arm axis. And then letter D, the elbow flexion angle. Letter D, the angle of rotation around the forearm axis. F, the angle of abduction or adduction in the wrist. And last but not the least, G angle of extension or flexion in the wrist. And then apart from the body position and motor activities, the forces connected with the execution of work are an important part of biomechanics. So we have internal, external and internal forces. So for external forces, include forces applied on the object of, of work. External forces can be measured experimentally using different measuring devices such as a dynamometer. And then, while internal forces include muscle forces, so it's internal. So, measuring internal forces, including muscle forces, may be attempted, but it requires disruption of the body covering, that is, the use of invasive measurement technique. So, this one, um, measure the muscle forces, uh, the, the device or the measurement device should be... Uh, it could penetrate the body. So that's why it's called invasive measurement tool. Okay, next is we have anthropometry and occupational biomechanics. Anthropometry is used in physical anthropology and involves comparative measurements of human body parts such as bone length, skull and head volume, body proportions, body weight, eye spacing, and so on. Designers of machines, devices, or working postures must determine the dimensions of their users. There are somatic anthropometric parameters such as the height, width, length, depth, and perimeters of different body parts and functional parameters which determine the distance and angular range of movements of different body segments. So, for designers of machines, devices, and working postures, so, for example, if your client are Asian and then is European, so, um, they should know the, the average or the normal distribution of the height uh, or the length of the knees, the length of the hands for Asian and, of course, for European. So, that the design of the tools that these two different people in terms of um, height or, or in other body composition or parts 
will be um will be taken into consideration. So this is the anthropometry for ASEAN, some of the ASEAN uh, countries involved. So, so we have Filipinos here. So actually, relatively, we're the smallest here. So the average height of a Filipino worker uh, in, a, uh, in a working stand is 153.9. So there are the measurements for the height, for the eye level, for the shoulders, and then to the elbows, and then to the knee joints. Okay, so this is an example of anthropometry. These are used by uh, the designers of machines. So that, for example, if your uh, if your worker are from the ASEAN, so the tallest is 160 centimeters. So these dimensions here, these values here, are in centimeters. So measurements of anthropometric parameters are subject to a normal distribution according to the Gaussian function that describes the number of cases in terms of a value corresponding to a measured anthropometric parameter. So the measurement characteristics of, of a population are described using the central concept, that is, a dot on a scale below which a determined percentage of cases can be found. For the purpose of designing and evaluating working postures, anthropometric data are usually given in the system of values represented as the 5th and 95th centiles. So these values are called extreme values and using them makes it possible to take into account differences among measurements involving 90% of the population. According to the variable distribution function, the 5th centile is a value of the measured parameter obtained in 5% of the population whereas the 95th centile is a value obtained in 95% of the population. This is a rule of limited measurements used to design working posture. So that's why, for example, we have an ergonomic chair. It is adjustable depending on the height, of the seating height of your, uh, uh, of, your um, of course, of the people who are going to use the ergonomic chair. So that adjustment it always depends on the 5th and 95th uh, centile and also on the anthropometry so the the length of the knees so that's why it's adjustable okay next is the dimensions of the human body and dimensions of the work stand determine the spatial structure of a working posture which means that in order to obtain optimum working posture it's necessary to adjust the workplace to the group of users so that's the goal of ergonomics the body should not be the one to adjust to the tool should be the tool that should just to the uh, body of the worker. So the anthropometric dimensions of a worker in relation to a working posture are of basic significance for taking into account a worker's load. The working posture may be adjusted to the individual dimensions of a user or to the dimensions of a population of target users. The spatial structure of a working posture has the construction, shape, size, and configuration of the work stand. So the worker's musculoskeletal load is mainly affected by the working posture, which is in direct contact with the work stand. A connection between the human body and the object is made through points with which the worker comes into tactual or visual contact. The work stand is a type of spatial stru structure, a configuration and location of, of control and informational elements, as well as location for work tools. The location of the contact point should correspond to the dimensional characteristics of the worker population. The structure, along with the contact points, determines the workspace and therefore determines the position of a worker's body and its musculoskeletal load resulting from the work being done. So we have criteria regarding occupational zones defined in the horizontal plane and the height of the occupational zones are used to determine the spatial occupational zones. So the horizontal plane has a normal range, a maximum range, and a forced range. So the normal range is the range determined by subsequent positions of the middle of the hand when the forearm is being rotated in relation to the elbow point. The maximum range is a less comfortable range of the upper limbs determined by the subsequent positions of the middle of the arm when the whole straightened limb is moved in relation to the shoulder. And we have the forced range. It's rich when body movements exceed the maximum range. The works performed in the maximum and forced ranges are especially unfavorable. 
Now, we have an illustration here, the occupational zones for the upper limbs in the horizontal plane. So, this gray area, this is the normal range in which the worker will not exer exert any force. It's relaxed while working, so it really helps the muscus musculoskeletal system. And then we have the maximum range. This is the maximum range. There's a little uh, force exerted. And then this is the borderline of the maximum range. And exceeding this borderline of the maximum range, this is the force range. So the force range is your limb, your upper limbs, is already stretching. For example, reaching for an object, reaching for the telephone. So it's also said in the last statement of the previous slide, works performed in the maximum and force range are especially unfavorable. As much as possible when we are working, we should be relaxed. But of course, not relaxed to the point that you are already sleepy, but um, it won't cause any musculoskeletal disorder, such as, for example, especially if the object is located in the force range. And then the height of the occupational space, depending on the type of work, is important to configure working postures. So the height of the occupational space is usually determined in relation to the ulnar height. Grand Jean suggested recommended heights of working planes for different types of jobs done in a standing position. So the first condition is, for jobs that do not require exceptional accuracy, the palm should reach 75 millimeters below the position of the elbows when arms are lowered freely. During manipulative jobs, the elbow should not be raised to heights greater than 100 millimeters above their position when the arms are lowered freely. And for jobs requiring accuracy and therefore exceptional visual control, occupational planes that are higher in relation to the normal position are applied. So for this example, if it's an accurate job, so the work uh, stand is higher than that uh, of a uh, uh, of a working stand for heavy jobs and for light jobs. Because why is it accurate jobs are relatively taller than light jobs and heavy jobs? Because for accuracy, you're using visual to check whether it's correct or not. So it should be relatively nearer uh, to the uh, high level, but it's nearer in relation to work stands of light jobs and heavy jobs. And then the rule applied when designing working posture is that external dimensions such as the location and distance of control elements are applied according to the dimensions of the fifth centile, whereas the internal dimensions such as the dimensions of the transition openings or accesses are applied according to the dimension of the 95th centile. Okay, next is we have biomechanical factors for musculoskeletal load. An approximately designed, ah, rather, an appropriately designed workplace should minimize the risk of musculoskeletal system disorder. So it's very important that your workplace is designed so that you will avoid or minimize the risk of musculoskeletal system disorders. So a worker's musculoskeletal load is influenced by biomechanical factors affecting humans, such as body segment position, external force, the type, direction, and value of a given force, and time factors. A time factor may be regarded as the duration for which a given body position is maintained. Often when a force is applied, the frequency of repetitions of given activities or the maximum duration of maintaining a static load or performing a repetitive task. So the body Position taken during work is determined by the relationships between the construction of a working posture, the necessity to perform given activities, and the anthropometric dimensions of the worker. For this reason, the design of a working posture should take into consideration the limitations associated with body dimensions in the work process. An appropriate body segment position will be provided when the spatial construction of a work stand is adjusted to the operator. Again, the general rule here the body should not adjust to the tool, but rather the tool should adjust to the user or the worker. When musculoskeletal load is at a minimum, the optimum body position is the position wherein the values of the angles describing a body position equal zero. That is the natural body position or the standing position. 
Washington. This is a standing position, as I've said, with the spine straight and upper limbs hanging along the body. In a body position that is uncomfortable, limited, or extremely deviated from the natural body position may cause overloading of muscles, ligaments, and tendons. So that's why you sh we should, for well, example, if we're sitting, we should sit, uh, sit up straight. Okay? So, as much as possible, that we, we should not extremely deviate our natural body position. So, the greater the deviation of the body from the natural position, the greater is the load of the musculoskeletal system. So, when the working posture is inappropriate and maintained for a longer period of time, it may cause a significant load on the muscular system. This phenomenon intensifies when a force must be applied to the components of a work stand, such as the means of work, work tools, and control elements. The body position affects not only the load on the joints that experience the force being applied, but also the characteristics of the force. The value of the maximum force being applied is greater for some angles in the joints than for others, which means that the body position differentiates the values of the maximum force being applied namely the maximum voluntary contraction or the MVC. However, the maximum values of the force are different depending not only on the body position but also on the type of applied force. In the case of the upper limbs, it is possible to distinguish activities that involve muscles of the whole upper limb such as lifting, pulling, pushing or rotation, pronation, and supination of the forearm, as well as activities that involve only local muscles, such as the grip of the hand, when the force is mainly exerted by the muscles of the hand and forearm. And because the position of the upper limbs has a significant effect on the value of the exerted maximum force, it is necessary to consider both the type of exerted force and the position of the upper limbs in order to obtain standard values of force. So moreover, individual factors such as age, sex, or muscle mass are significant for defining the force characteristics. So research has shown that external force in women is about 75% of the force in men, which mainly results from differences in the muscle mass between these two populations. So that's why, again, according to our first lesson, men has a more maximum oxygen intake than women, so it is uh, concluded that men has a higher physical capacity than women. And apart from the external force exerted and inappropriate body positions during work, the rhythm of the work is also a cause of muscular system disorders. So it is said here, static load and repetitive load are the most dangerous for the musculoskeletal system. Static load. Example of static load, for example, uh, so it, is there an instance, for example, you're playing your favorite mobile game and you've been staying in your position, for example, for a whole day, and then you felt that your, your muscle is chained even though you haven't moved? So that's just an example of a static load. So uh, uh, if you are already can feel it, it means that, uh, oh, actually, though it's maybe it's simple, but stated here, these are the most dangerous for musculoskeletal system. You must move or stretch your fingers, your elbows, and your arm. And also repetitive load. So repetitive load such as, for example, again, for typing, since we're always using our hands, what if you're not you're not a very good type, typist and you're only using uh, two fingers, one per hand? So it means there's a strain on your, for example, on your index finger, if it, if it is the the, the, the sole finger that you're using for typing. So that's also a repetitive load. So again, most dangerous for the musculoskeletal system. So if it is uh, really chronic already, uh, the only way to cure that is through surgical operation. So static muscle tension is isometric muscle contractions in which the muscle, muscle length does not change as, 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 as for the previous lesson. The constant muscle length occurs in situations in which the positions of the involved body segments do not change. So from an ergonomic point of view, static muscle tension is characterized by the duration of the tension for a given level of the force. So again, um, static muscle, static load as much as possible, avoid it. So if you're going to play games that does not change your um, elbow and hand positions, 
uh, maybe it's not really, it will not hurt your game if you will take breaks. And then repetitive muscle tension is caused by a constant repetitive loading of the same tissues, as I've said. Our fingers, our index fingers, these are only the two fingers that we use here of when taking. And then repetitive work, according to Kilbom, it's work that requires the performance of similar cycles of occupational activities several times. So for this repetitive and static load, you should take breaks. So that is to uh, not to burden your tissues and your muscles. According to research, repetitive work, that is work when the time period of a repeated cycle is less than 30 seconds, may be a reason for the development of musculoskeletal system disorder. For example, you're playing game and um, you're using your thumb. For for kicking or for you, again the index finger. So if your kicking or using your index finger and thumb is less than the repeated cycle is less than thirty seconds. So there there will be a possibility of the development of musculoskeletal system disorder. So a working posture should be designed so that activities requiring force exertion are performed in an optimal way, taking into account positions of separate body segments direction, type and value of an exerted force, its frequency of occurrence, and the duration of the action. Moreover, different muscle groups should be activated alternately during work thus not to cause static overload and fatigue of the musculoskeletal system. Again, as I've said, our body is made to move, so we should move, we should take breaks, we should stretch, we should exercise because, uh, of course, we have so many joints. So, it's very dangerous if we will live a sedentary lifestyle. Okay, next is we have assessment of load of the musculoskeletal system based on both the activity of the muscles and models of a human body. The load on the worker's musculoskeletal system may be assessed as external load related to the static and dynamic physical effort or internal load or related to the reaction of the body to the development of external load. External load can be assess assessed using different methods such as the OVACO working posture analysis system, occupational repetitive actions, repetitive task indicator method. So these methods assess load based on parameters that describe the positions of separate body segments, the force exerted by the worker, and the time sequences of load. Internal load and workers' fatigue can be assessed using methods such as analysis of blood pressure, analysis of energy expenditure, or analysis of the electric signal that characterizes muscle contractions, namely surface EMG. In the last several years, surface EMG has become one of the most dynamically developing methods to assess workload and muscle fatigue. So, EMG is based on the recording of electrical activity from selected muscles involved in the performance of activities. Surface electrodes register signals in a non-invasive and relatively easy way, so that's called a surface EMG. It's not, not, it's not invasive. And measurements can be performed at a workplace. The EMG signal is the source of a great deal of information regarding processes that occur in the muscles, including muscle load and fatigue. This is an example, raw electromyography signal registered using exertion of increasing levels of force. So meaning, so this, um, this uh, graph illustrates that there is increasing level of force. So the force is stronger here relate, uh, in relation to the left. And then muscle fatigue is the result of processes that change the ability of the muscle to retain a determined level of force and or static body position and is defined as the decreased force generation possibility resulting from an increased feeling of effort. The changes occurring as a result of muscle fatigue are visible in the electromyogram recording. Muscle fatigue causes an increase in the EMG signal amplitude and a shift in the power spectrum towards low frequency. This is visible as a change in the values of the EMG signal parameter. The analysis of the EMG signal has some limitations, especially in relation to muscle fatigue. This means that it is far more complex to examine the consequences of repetitive load than those of static load. 
And then another, aside from EMG, is rapid development in the field of technology favors the development of computer methods based on human body models of different complexities to assess the musculoskeletal system. Computer models are developed based on material models that use mathematical modeling and computer simulation. So the first stage of model generation is theoretical research and starts with the formulation of a mathematical description of a tested biomechanical system. Multi-body and finite elements are the most common types of models. However, mixed models are also used. And there are also multi-body type models examining the human motor system as a multi-segment system that is as a biomechanism consisting of solid segments linked with biokinetic kinematic pairs or joints driven by the forces exerted by muscles or group of muscles. The multi-body models may be static or dynamic. So, two basic types of dynamic tasks can be solved using a derived mathematical model. By means of simple dynamics, it is possible to track the course in time or trajectory of transitions, velocities, and accelerations of any number of selected points in the human body if the course in time of the force is exerted by the muscles or force moments in relation to the rotation axis in the joint and the external forces applied to the model segment are known. And then we also have reverse dynamics. It is possible to determine the course in time of the moments of muscle forces that cause the movement and the reaction forces in the joints by solving an equation of motion if the trajectories are of selected system points a given motion are known based on experimental studies. So, physical models with distributed parameters are generated by precise representation of the geometry of the human body using a great number of elements, hence the finite element method. The mathematical description of such models is extremely complex and comprises systems of equations from several hundred to tens of thousands of equations, depending on the size of the model body part, the generation and solution of which is only possible using special computer methods. So one example of a model developed using the finite element method or FEM is the spatial model of the musculoskeletal system of the human trunk which takes into account the complexity of a shape that is difficult to represent. So this is the finite element method model of the trunk. So letter A, view of the model back and then B is the modeled muscles. So this model can be used to assess the load of the lumbar spine under different conditions of external load associated with occupational activities performed. The results of the model calculations may include, among others, transitions of the model elements, stresses in the intervertebral discs and other lumbar and or lumbar vertebrae, and the forces acting on the modeled muscles. So, so this is lesson two selected issues of occupational biomechanics. So our takeaway points here is that, of course, we should take care of our body. So the tool should adjust our body, uh, body movements, our body composition, the length, our, our knee, our height, or our arm's length. And you should not be the one who will adjust because, of course, you will develop mus musculoskeletal disorder. And you don't. Ha uh, you must remember that Static load and repetitive loads are the most dangerous for your musculoskeletal system. So if you are in a sedentary lifestyle and for the whole day you did that move, you maintain that position, and take a break, stretch, exercise, move the joints so that, of course, it's a way of taking care of our body. So again, in relation to our uh, the previous lesson, we must uh, include in our daily routine exercises because, as I've said, uh, because uh, our body has 240 or 250 numbers of degrees of freedom, it means that our body is really made for moving and it's not meant for a sedentary lifestyle. So I hope that you will have a fast, uh, 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 active um, lifestyle, workout, train, so to increase your physical capacity. So if you have any questions, feel free to comment below and please don't uh, forget uh, to subscribe to my channel and so this is for our lesson for the selected issues of occupational biomechanics so thank you very much for listening good day and stay safe